So we have uh, Richard Ferdell, we have Carl Paulson, we have Andy uh, Starks, uh, and we have uh, David uh, Cipini. And the topic they're going to talk about is the JTNM Pro AV Technology Roadmap. So, um, yeah, I'm actually quite happy that we've got a JTNM roadmap for IPMX. I think that, uh, that uh, you know, over the last year, the big thing that really happened is we were able to start gaining a little bit more visibility and more momentum. And we started to bring on more organizations. Uh, VSF, namely, has a great IPMX group that's been doing some very good work. Uh, we've started off efforts in AMWA. Ames continues to drive from their uh, initial starting position, you know, and we even seen some noise over at Simti, and that's great because it just shows how there's such momentum that is starting to pick up. And the problem with having so many groups is then you got to keep them in sync, right? Like uh, who's beating the drum? And enter JTNM with uh, a great introduction, and in fact, we do have a a uh, introduction PowerPoint that uh, talks about um, this uh, roadmap presentation. And I guess I could share my screen and uh, show that off. The uh, Pro-AV uh, technology roadmap really is meant to serve as a uh, disambiguator about who's doing what in the Pro-AV space. To Richard's point about uh, the JTNM being a um, a clearinghouse for uh, the different member organizations and who's doing what work where. Uh, I just would like to say at the beginning here that Dave mentioned uh, Ames and Ames has made an, an, a contribution to this. The relationship between the, the JTNM member organizations and Ames is that we are doing the technical development and Ames is uh, largely a, a, a uh, marketing organization trying to assess user requirements and to uh, help promote the adoptions of the, of the technologies. But the, the reason that the uh, JTNM group picked this up was because we saw that there was a technical work starting in a number of organizations. And as Dave said, we wanted to be sure that everybody was on the same page and that people were working together. So one of the first things that we found out from our colleagues in the uh, pro AV world is that there uh, really wasn't a definition of pro AV, which kind of was surprising to me as a broadcaster, it's not my space. So the first thing we had to do was develop a statement that at least we could use as a, de as a uh, definition of pro AV for the purposes of interpreting the roadmap. Turns out Pro-AV is pretty darn big, who knew? Uh, well, these guys knew, but again, new to me. Um, so we came up with the market for audiovisual communications equipment used in professional, industrial, commercial, and retail environments as a means to communicate with people. Obviously that covers a lot of landscape. Um, some key features of the roadmap and what we were trying to do are listed here. I'm not going to go through them all. I'll just say that we developed key features in the group. The roadmap shows three uh, different phases. The first phase focuses on um, basically what we have now that we have already done that we can make use of it at, at this point. I think I have it. There we go. I have a bigger slide without the words. So this makes use of existing technologies that I think uh, most people at, at VidTrans here should be familiar with. Um, the NMOS suite and uh, the various specifications uh, around 702110. The second phase adds things that were identified in the Pro-AV user requirements, copy protection, content protection, forward error correction, specific audio formats for Pro-AV that help with interoperability and then digging into the aspects of control. And the third phase, where we would like to go in the future, security is not blank because we don't care about it, it's because we care about it a lot and hopefully we focused on it and delivered that early. 
but then there's addi additional functionality in the areas of media and control. So rather than go through all of this in detail, I would tell you guys that you can find this roadmap published at JTNM, jt-nm.org. The roadmap is there. Um, and uh, I will hand things back over to you, Dave. You can tell me if you want me to stop sharing this or if there are particular slides you want to go back and dig into uh, to talk with the panel about. Well, um, let's uh, leave it up for the moment and uh, just leave it on this slide as a background. Maybe we'll try and use it to drive some of the conversation. So, I mean, we, we did cover the fact that uh, there is a need in the pro AV industry for a standard. And, uh, you know, perhaps the, uh, we have had this discussion before, but it may not have reached everyone that's here. The, in the pro AV industry, it, it's different than broadcast. It's a, a more fragmented space where things are less interrelated. There isn't a single strong group of customers that dominate the space. So you don't get a lot of that clear, capturing requirements is a lot more difficult because there's all these little micro silos. And because of that, what ends up happening is you often get uh, very fractured solutions because they really deal with one micro silo. It means there's a lot of people reinventing the wheel in that group, uh, as opposed to in broadcast where it happens much less. So the uh, that's maybe why there are over a hundred companies that have an AV over IP solution that they've developed with, you know, building, stitching together existing technologies and adding some of their own, but none of them interoperable and all of them doing things maybe just a little bit different, maybe tailored for their space. Um, but the reality is that that fragmentation is what results in suppressing the industry because everybody is investing so much R&D and nobody is like saying, okay, here's a foundation, let's invest on top of it. And, you know, and I feel that's one of the things that really holds AV over IP back from just exploding. But as it stands, it is a fast growing market and it's the right time for a standard to show up in that space. Anybody have a supporting anecdote or commentary on that from the group or even a counter from supporting? I, I would say that if you compared the pro AV industry to the professional broadcast industry, that pro AV probably has a lot longer uh, tail, a lot longer thread there in, in a lot of different dimensions, whereas broadcast, at least until recent times, has been very focused on uh, studio type environments, studio and delivery, uh, maybe remote productions and things of that nature. But you, there isn't a, a building that, or a facility that you can walk into that doesn't have in some form, uh, an element of pro AV, whether it's a, a Nike store, a bank, a, a shopping center, any of those areas are all using uh, technologies that they basically need to grasp a hold of one format or one structure, one manufacturer, and go with it for their system because there's a lack of interoperability. And I think if you could sum all of the things that we've put in phase one, two, and three together, it's probably creating uh, a means for total interoperability across all different elements that we do in much smaller segments inside of Pro AV. I, I totally agree with, with both of your points. Um, I, I would say though that maybe another way that I've kind of maybe looked at this is that, I mean, actually Carl, to add to what you said, also in broadcasting, right? There's uh, Pro AV all over, <laughs> all over broadcasters facilities and they're using equipment that um, even consumers are using and the same is true in pro AV. and one of the observations that I think that this process has really kind of brought forward is that we're seeing a, um, a real dispersing of of who a broadcaster is and who who is doing live production and the fact that interactivity and, and live production really have a lot of the same problems in terms of latency and response times. Um, and so we're seeing that um, that really IPMX, while we, we really have 
sort of broaden out the SMPT focus to be, or the VSF focus to include Pro-AV, it, it really is more just a generalization of the technology to match the, the foundation, the IP foundation that, that we're building on um, to cover, you know, really everybody that's using technology that touches content. Um, and so I look forward, you know, I think one of the interesting and fun things to look at is that IPMX, unlike other offerings in the pro AV world is equally at home in that production world. And so in, in pro AV, where you've got people making content and presenting content, now there's an opportunity to just have one network that handles AV over IP that can handle both of those use cases. I think Andrew really uh, said what I was really thinking about trying to bring up as a point here. I think it, you know, it is interesting how much quote pro AV is in broadcast stations at the moment. You know, Carl alluded to that. It's everywhere. It's including in broadcast. We use it all the time at, at, at Fox. Uh, you think about all the remote broadcasting that uh, is being done these days because of just like the trans is virtual. A lot of our broadcast is virtual. Um, we're using pro AV equipment as much as we use, you know, frankly, we're using anything we could find to make it work. To be perfectly honest, um, and uh, you know, I, I did want to just touch on why this is at uh, VSF. It seemed like the logical extension uh, of our twenty one ten work. Um, so that, that it was driven by uh, by others. To be fair, it was it wasn't my idea. I wish I could claim it. I can't. Uh, but there are a number of other people so on on this uh, panel who who drove this in in VSF. But it, it does seem like a perfectly logical extension of it. And I, it, it was referred to at one point as 2110 light. I don't really like that, uh, that uh, the terminology of that name. Um, I sort of think, think of it as um, almost a training uh, program or a training methodology for 2110 for our broadcast stations. Um, you know, 2110 is, is, a, is fantastic. And obviously, I'm very proud of the work we've done on it. And we've certainly used it at Fox throughout our, our, our broadcast centers. But you know, TV stations are less sophisticated. They don't have the kind of economics that the network has. And they're always looking for ways to do things quicker, faster, cheaper, like everyone. And this is, I think, going to be a great introduction to get our stations into you know, 2110, sort of the easy way. Because it's a little less constrained. It's a little easier to use. And we'll use this to ultimately get to you know, full-blown 2110 facilities. So that, that should give somebody something to say. <laughs> I, I, think it, I, I, I think that, that, that this is a point that we share with, uh, with Pro Audio as well, right? Yes. So in both the, the Pro AV and the Pro Audio space, when I was at Turner, you would have areas of pro audio that were set up and they were at you know as big as uh, professional audio studios a and the same thing you would have people going out doing remote productions or whatever they might be doing with whatever equipment they had available and you know then the solution about how to get that stuff to um, interface to our facilities to our main facilities was always left to to you know my staff people like Carl I'm sure and you know same with with you Richard and that was not not that hard in the analog world but when you know you go into digital audio workstations and then you go to uh, I remember when SLR cameras started showing up and you know, people were coming in with format of the week and, and now going to live IP structures coming out of these, uh, out of these devices, uh, going into native 2110 facilities. And I think the hope here is that it's easier for that kind of technological base of IPMX to feed into pro AV or, or uh, uh, to feed into our, our main uh, broadcast facilities. But I think there's something else going on here that's really critical. I just, you already touched on it, Richard, but I wanna hit that again. I think the, the reality is that the, um, you can have quite simple 
to extremely complex pro AV installations. And we shouldn't think that just because an installation is a, is a pro AV installation, it's not complicated or that it isn't worth millions of dollars. Neither one of those are true. But what is true, I think, and I think Richard and Carl can speak maybe more directly to that than, than I can uh, in recency of experience is that, you know, at that station level or at some college football event or something that is going to a, a, a broadcast station, the, the level of, of technical expertise that it takes to make a, a full up, you know, gold plated Olympics uh, capable 2110 facility, it, it's, it's not there. And we need some sort of solution for that. And um, I, I, I'm hopeful that, that this would provide a, a, a path for that. But you guys can speak better to that than I can. Trying to build a 2110 plant is a, a very rigorous, um, you, you know, uh, uh, activity. And you know, we do that. In fact, we're doing a big project right now for our first station that's going to be oh, 2110 with Carl in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I have to give a, a credit to NBC, who's really done much more of this at the local station level. But it, it takes a dedicated team of people who are really knowledgeable about this. And, and we have them, of course, but not to the degree that, you know, you think about a station group that has two, 300 stations, like some now do Sinclair and and next door. That expertise is just not available across that many stations. So it's, it's, it's going to be incremental in how it comes in, just like it does in most businesses and uh, media businesses anyway. And I think this is a perfect way to, to, to get us there. I don't know, Carl might disagree with that. I, I don't know. I think there's some very, very good and um, important elements in what we're doing in IPMX that um, are going to bridge particularly well into uh, environments for broadcasters in that use 2110. The perfect example is probably some more focus on compressed video as opposed to <clears throat> everything being uncompressed. Um, you start with compressed video facilities in a pro AV world and in a broadcast world, you start with uncompressed and end what, with a compressed environment. Um, it, there's huge numbers in broadcast plants when you start to think of building a multi-control room, multi-studio 4K facility, upwards of hundreds of terabits a second of data that have to be processed in some form. If we could take the approaches and some of the things that have been done in a 4K implementation in a pro AV world and equate what happened, what, it, what they had to do to make that work, we have a whole new equation here for, for both ends. And everybody wins in that environment. And I think that's the point behind this is everyone wins by making this uh, common and interchangeable and interoperable. Yeah, thank you, Carl. And one, uh, in our closing minutes here, I want to go back to our, our pro AV colleagues here. Um, Dave, you talked about that a little bit. Are there other upsides that you would want to emphasize uh, to the, the uh, IPMX technology roadmap that might apply more broadly to the uh, IP, to the, to the uh, video over IP uh, environment. I think I got the wrong term there. I'm sorry. I'm still learning. Thank goodness. As old as I am, I'm still learning this terminology. Straighten me out here. Um, we got about, we got a couple of minutes left. I'll try and be efficient. I'm not even sure I got your whole meeting there, Brad. So I might miss on this one. But I think one of the other things that's, I think, a great introduction on IPMX that's going to help out, absolutely required in pro AV, but also is going to help out broadcast is the new introduction of HDMI support under this umbrella. And obviously, not every display needs to be an SDI-based display or, you know, and having the HDMI in there allows for a different cost structure, a different set of availability. And I think that that's a big advent that will help everybody. And I think Carl is absolutely going down the right alley. It's the compression that's going to it. By the way, you can run uncompressed under IPMX as well. But the fact is that because of the big focus on compression, which is going to be the most popular in Pro AV, well, I think that that's going to help accelerate how compression works, working through problems and discovering all the, the corner cases and the catch 22s. 
So the fact that we have this both in Pro EV and in broadcast working at the same time is just going to mean that we're going to get a much stronger rounded solution at the end of the day. And that's really what open standards are all about, right? That's what's going to give us the best solution overall. We have way more people contributing to getting the right answer. Absolutely. Andy, any closing thoughts? No, I think I think we've we've kind of covered it. I'm I'm very excited to watch what happens as we converge. I think that we're gonna see a lot of opportunities for broadcast manufacturers and broadcasters. And I think um, the Pro AV market is gonna be something that you know all of us are gonna be participating more in in the future. Great, thank you. I I do wanna recognize AIM's role. They made an initial contribution of their uh, marketing roadmap for Pro AV to the JTNM, and the JTNM very much appreciates their contribution and recognizes that quite a bit of the, the roadmap comes from their uh, Pro AV working group, which I think started, Dave, in, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the, the, the very, very end, like literally a few days before the end of the year of December 2018, and, uh, and then has gotten here now. Yeah, so we want to we want to uh, thank them for their contribution and the the JTNM being the organizations creating the uh, the technological open uh, specifications and standards are looking forward to continuing our relationship with Ames to uh, drive the adoption of that. So with that, we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists. Thank you guys very much for for being here.